All right, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I was uh, Gary's colleague for many years, and um, you know, people argue about whether there's such a thing as human capital externalities. You know, if you've been on the faculty at Chicago, like, you, you just, you wouldn't doubt it. Um, you know, you, you, you learn stuff from your colleagues all the time, there's spillovers. Bob said this morning that, you know, spillovers, he, he had a, a, a model where, you know, agents bump into each other and he, he was quick to say, oh, don't take that too literally. And I'm thinking, oh, well, why not? You know, I bump into people at lunch, at coffee, and I learn a huge amount. So the, the bumping into people that you learn from, I think as academics, you know, um, we all learn a lot from each other. Um, I've certainly learned a lot at Chicago and, uh, you know, especially uh, I learned a lot from Gary. So it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so there's a little bit of bait and switch here. The original title that I gave to uh, Isaac was, um, had to do with growth. Um, I'll come back to that, you know, if I have a few minutes at the end and explain why growth is a, like, a much harder problem than uh, I thought. So the model I'm talking about here is one that, you know, uh, the growth question got me started on. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm here I'm going to look at some, uh, some you know, kind of static, more static uh, questions with that same model. Okay, so in this model, I'm going to just look at a simple general equilibrium model where there's complementarity between technology and human capital. Um, and I would say there, there, you know, there are a couple of motivations. So I didn't have even put the, my original motivation was to think about long-run growth and think about investment from both sides. So workers investing in human capital, firms investing in technology, and the fact that, you know, if, if you think about a, you know, like, you know, decade after decade, you know, it's, if you don't have investment on both sides, to me, it's just, you know, you're going to run into pretty massively decreasing returns if you only invest on one side. So that was the original motivation. But um, let's, let's think about some others. Another one is that, you know, it's like by now everybody is no, like, that knows that wage inequality in the U.S. has grown tremendously in the last, you know, what, four decades, maybe even longer. So there was a period in the 50s and 60s, kind of a great compression when, you know, wa you know wages and earnings were getting more compressed. I think there were a couple of decades where if you looked at the distribution of earnings, you know, like a log distribution, it would just like march to the right and everybody is gaining. And then that kind of broke down and the skill premium grew and uh, in recent decades, um, you know, the, the earnings gap between the highest earners and lowest has gotten even wider. Now to me, like that, it just, that's a phenomenon, you know, if both if you think about the, the great compression that Claudia Golden talked about and you think about the, you know, increasing skill premium now, those are phenomena that just cry out for an explanation that has to do with technology. Um, okay, um, people who've looked at the, this increase in uh, earnings inequality in the U.S. looking at, you know, kind of uh, uh, tax data from the U.S. find, this is matched employer-employee data, find that almost all of it is like between, increases in between firm inequality. So it's not, it, you know, within, and this holds like within industries. So the stuff that the newspapers focus on, which is CEO pay and how that's grown, it's true, but that's just a tiny little bit of the overall picture. The more important thing is that earnings inequality has grown up and, you know, through the whole scale, and most of it has to, has to do with between firm, you know, the best, the best paying firms in an industry are now paying relatively even more than they did compared with the worst firms. And it's not that the CEOs are getting so much more than the, the middle ranked workers. Again, it seems like there's, has, like to me it suggests a technology story. Um, Another one is that people have found, and people have found similar things looking uh, in the UK. The picture in Germany is maybe a little more mixed. Another thing people have found is that there seems to be now better sorting. If, you know, we try and, like, uh, 
you know, type workers by their, you know, skill level, type firms by their technology level, that the, there's always been, you know, kind of a sort of mating between workers and firms, but that's getting stronger, okay? And we could ask, why is that? And so, I guess if you look, there are, you know, these models that with search frictions that think about, you know, like a setting where you'd, you'd sort of like to have perfectly assortative mating, but it frictions in the search process prevent that from happening. So maybe these uh, search frictions are getting less important than they used to be. People, both workers and firms, can search more, uh, you know, like more effectively and find the, you know, the mate with which they're better um, matched. So a lot of this work, you know, they so far has used, I would say, like a pretty restrictive, pretty restrictive set of assumptions about, you know, the, the nature of this, uh, the complementarity. And um, so, you know, I think another, another motivation in this model, perhaps at some point will be to like go back and to uh, revisit some of this literature on um, uh, search frictions and provide uh, a little bit more flexible microeconomic underpinning. Um, okay, so, and, and the, I mean, the main, the main thing that's going to happen here is that, you know, some firms are more productive, some are less productive, in a, and I'm not going to have any search frictions at all. And so then, you know, the search guys ask me, so why doesn't everybody work for the most productive firm? And it's, the fact is that it's because firms produce different products and every product, uh, you know, has downward sloping demand. Okay, um, yeah, you could fill up several pages with references. That's not a very good page, so I'll, I'll just not say that much. Okay, so, so the main idea is gonna be to think about human capital and technology. Um, now, some people would say that technology is just a form of human capital. I know there's one, at least one guy sitting right here in the front row who tells me that, you know, repeatedly. Um, I, I'm, I'm still convinced that there's a, an interesting distinction between the two. And to me, the distinction is that human capital, I want to think of as something that belongs to an individual worker. The worker uses it, he or she, and, and you know, nobody else can really use it directly. You can, you know, maybe it can spill over, maybe you can educate somebody, but I can only, I'm the only one who can make use of my human capital. Um, so in the, in the, in the uh, technical jargon, it's a rival input. Um, technology, on the other hand, I want to think of as something that belongs to a firm, and all the employees of the firm can make use of that. Um, so, in, in that so it's a non-rival input. If, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, Amazon has a great technology and they have thousands of employees, all of those employees can make use of Amazon's technology. Um, and, I, and I guess the fact that once you have it, it's, you know, it's non-rival, it can be used freely by all of the workers, distinguishes it also from physical capital. Now, when I, when I, you know, get into, when I sort of get to the model explicitly, in, there are a lot of places where if you just took the thing that I'm calling technology and replaced it with physical capital, you know, it might not look very different. And, you know, I, I don't want to really argue about that either. To me, the distinct, you know, there's also kind of a blurry line there if I think about, you know, the fact that, like, today we work with more capital what does that mean? It means, you know, I have a laptop instead of just a pencil. Well, the laptop is more capital, but it also there's some technology there that, you know, like I don't care how many mountains of pencils you give me, you know, the laptop is something qualitatively different. So it's not just more physical capital, but there's a technology there which uh, you just, you know, is, is something different. So there's, you know, there's, there's if you, uh, you know, if you think about the notion of embodied technical change, this is an ancient idea that goes way back, which is that a lot of new technologies require some kind of physical capital for their implementation. So it's, you know, sometimes a little hard to, you know, like, you know, disentangle the technology from the capital. 
Okay, so the main idea here is that technology and human capital are going to be inputs in a CES production function. Um, the elasticity in that function is going to be less than unity, so in that sense they're complements. Um, the, all the labor markets here are going to be frictionless, and the low elasticity means you know, we're going to have this you know, perfectly assortative matching between uh, firms and workers. Okay, and we're just going to see where that leads us. And the question I want to focus on is how technical change can impact uh, wage inequality in this setting. Okay, so uh, in the re for the rest of the talk, I'm going to you know just <coughs> lay out the the model, um, talk a little bit about the competitive equilibrium, and then ask the ch the question about technical change. So if we put in technical change. You know, for some firms, the question to, uh, to you know, to quote uh, John Kennedy, does a, does a rising tide lift all boats? And the question is going to be, in this first model, basically, you know, yeah, it does. And like Derone alluded to this uh, uh, in his talk this morning. Um, so, yeah. And then I'm going to look at a, 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 an extension of the model with that has different sectors and revisit that quite question and there we're going to find that you know you can you can reverse the answer and it's you know and it's not that hard it's not going to be that hard to reverse the answer it's sort of the the key is you know it's like hiding right there in plain sight there's nothing there's not going to be anything very tricky about it and then you know, if I have a little time at the end I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about growth Okay, so the model is, you know, it's, it's one, you know, a lot of you, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a bare bones macro model in a lot of uh, respects. There's going to be a single final good that's produced competitively with constant returns to scale, and the inputs are differentiated goods. Um, the producers of these differentiated goods are going to be distinguished by their technology level, Xi. So here, the technology levels are discrete. Um, uh, X, Xj, J goes from one to capital J. So Xi is the level of the technology. There are going to be a lot of firms with the same technology level, the same Xj, but they produce different goods. So every firm here uh, produces its own uh, distinct uh, output and is they, they engage in monopolistic competition. So everyone is a monopolist, but they have not that much monopoly power. Okay, so the, 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 the index of their technology, XJ, that's going to determine the price that they end up charging. So all the firms that have the same technology level will charge the same price. And all the differentiated products uh, enter the final goods uh, technology symmetrically. So there it is. It's a standard, you know, uh, you know uh, Dixit Stiglitz aggregator, the same one that uh, Derone used this morning. Okay, so gamma, capital N is going to be the total mass of firms. Um, gamma J is the fraction of firms that have technology level J. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, and here we have another substitution elasticity. This one is going to be greater than one, and I, I want to think of it as being, you know, quite a bit greater than one. Okay, for the usual reasons. We'll see rho, rho determines the markup that these firms charge over unit cost. So to keep markups to a reasonable level, rho has to be, I'm going to use six when I do a numerical simulation. Okay, so uh, then the final good is going to have a price. This is, this is a, a, just a purely real model. There's no money here, for, you know, no sticky prices. So I'm going to use the final good as my numeraire. So the price of the final good is always normalized to one. Everything is measured in terms of final good. And demands for these differentiated goods are, notice, okay, the demand for a product J depends on its own price PJ relative to the price of the final good. So that, bot that's, you know, denominator is unity. And then it's just scaled by output of the final good. Okay, so that's the firm side. Um, labor is the only input, the, other, the only other input into production. 
And labor is distinguished by its human capital level. And uh, I'm going to take human capital to have a continuous distribution. Um, you know, it doesn't really, you know, you can make them both continuous, you can make them both discrete. At the moment, this seems to be like the most graceful way to make various mathematics work out. So this is what I'm trying. So H is going to have a continuous distribution. Um, and the output of a particular firm is going to depend on the size and the human capital level of its workforce. So a firm with technology level XJ that employs different kinds of workers with different human capital levels. So think of LJ as like the number of workers with human capital H. And you know, one worker with human capital H with this technology, that's his output. And then we just add up over the workers. Okay, so there's no complementarity across workers with, within a firm. I think that would be an interesting thing to explore, but I, I don't have it here. You just add, so there's complementarity between X and H, and then it's, it's just lin and it's linear across workers. Okay, so if we think of a worker with technology level uh, XJ, um, they're only going to employ types of workers that minimize their unit cost. So that's W over phi. And uh, A to less than 1 is what delivers assortative matching. And so in equilibrium, you know, how, if we think about an equilibrium for this economy, what's going to characterize it? We have our continuum of human capital levels. Um, I'm going to always say there's a, there's a top and a bottom. And then there are going to be thresholds. And uh, you know, the bottom interval is working for the X1 firms. The next interval is working for the X2 firms, and so on. So right up the scale. So an equilibrium is going to be characterized be, the, the, by these thresholds that allocate workers across firms. And workers with H between BJ minus 1 and BJ work for firms of type J. And the top and the bottom are pegged down by the distribution of human capital. Okay, and then uh, the firms have some monopoly power in their product market, but labor markets are perfectly competitive. So uh, competition for workers, you know, competition across firms for these workers means they're within each of these intervals, their wages are you know, going to uh, uh, increase in proportion with their productivity. So we get a, just this uh, characterization of the, the you know, derivative of the wage function within each one of these intervals. And then you can have a kink where it crosses these, the boundaries between, uh, between bins. OK, so here each firm is going to have a unit cost that's going to depend on the types of work. You know, it's going to be minimized by the types of workers that it hires. Um, and price, it's going to set a price that's a markup over unit cost. Um, OK, and since uh, you know, adjacent firms, there's a worker right in between that both of them are willing to hire. Prices, the ratio of prices for J plus 1 versus J is going to be proportional to the, uh, uh, the ratio of the inverse ratio of the productivities. And the outputs are going to be the productivities raised to the power uh, rho. So um, firms with higher productivity have lower prices and higher outputs. They also are going to have higher revenue and profits. OK. And there's some you know, indeterminacy in the exact allocation of labor across firms within a technology type. You know, firms could specialize in hiring workers in some little subinterval. Um, and then depending on which subinterval they choose, they might have to hire you know, like more or fewer workers. All, that, all that's pinned down in equilibrium are their output levels. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I, I, I may just you know, think of them all as hiring uh, human capital levels in proportion to their representation in the population you know, within the correct bin. 
Okay, so what's, uh, what's going to characterize the equilibrium? So if we think of this integral at the top, if we multiplied that thing by capital L, that's like the total productive capacity of firms in that interval from Bj minus 1 to Bj when they're working at firm J. So this thing on the left is the productive capacity of that labor. And on the right is the total demand from these firms with technology J. So it's their, the number of such firms multiplied by how much output each is producing. And so a competitive equilibrium has to satisfy labor market clearing for each of these intervals of labor. And, uh, then, um, and then we also need this, this uh, ratio condition to describe the output levels you know, across adjacent uh, types of firms. And it's pretty easy to show that the, an equilibrium exists and it's unique. Okay, so let's look at an example just, um, just uh, to see kind of what things look like. So in this example, actually, I've taken x to be continuous. So think of these intervals as being, you know, the interval for x is having a very, very fine grid. Um, the distribution of firms is going to be Pareto um, truncated. The distribution of human capital is going to be log normal. And... Uh, you know, five million firms and 100 million workers is, you know, the ballpark for the U.S. Okay, so here we have labor productivity. Um, so this is uh, log H and log of labor productivity for different X values. <coughs> and so what you see here is that uh, you know, every type of worker is more productive if he's working with a higher X, but the, uh, the higher H workers get proportionately a bigger boost from moving to a higher X. And here, if we look across, sorry, in, the, in, with, in this example, across different types of firms, um, The top panel shows unit cost and price across different types of firms. Uh, one is the price of the final good, and this is the employment for, for, per firm by X type. And here, employment actually goes up with X. Um, that's not, a, you know, you could contrive examples where it's flat or even downward sloping, um, <coughs> but here it's upward sloping. Uh, you know, you could think about taking this model also to data on the distribution of firm sizes, but it's very hard to get enough very, uh, to get the, the enormous range in firm size that you find in the data. So here they, they go from what, like, you know, eight workers to 100 workers. Big firms in the U.S. should have, the littlest firm should have one worker, and the big ones should have 10,000, 100,000. I guess Walmart's more like several hundred thousand. If we think about the allocation of human capital types to firm types, there it is. Um, first, it increases rather sharply, then more flat in the middle, and then it increases more sharply again. The red line would be um, just a, a constant elasticity function. And so this, the actual allocation is more, it's, it's very U-shaped. And that's because there are lots of firms at the bottom, because the firms have a Pareto distribution. So the firms have to um, uh, kind of work up, you know, they have to work their way up the human capital ladder pretty rapidly because they're so numerous. And at the other end, um, the log normal has a much thinner tail than the Pareto. So again, at the upper end, the firms are numerous relative to the workers. And you know, the wage function is the, the dotted line is a constant elasticity. And uh, this one is uh, uh, the one, the equilibrium wage function is a bit more concave. So constant elasticity, you know, doesn't fit, wouldn't fit too badly, but it's um, definitely downward sloping here. Okay, so now I want to ask the question, um, does a, 
uh, can a lot, uh, you know, if we look at a small increment to technology for one type of firm, um, what does it do to wages across the board? So the questions are, you know, first, what are the short run effects on output for each type of firm and final output? And what happens to prices while before labor reallocates? And then when we let labor reallocate, what's the long run effect? Um, and what happens to employment and wages? Okay, so I'm going to uh, follow the macro tradition and use hats for proportionate changes. Um, so it's useful noting the proportionate change in final output is just a weighted sum of the proportionate changes in the inputs, and the weights are the cost shares. Okay, so they add up to one. That's true for both the short run and the long run. Okay, so in the short run, what happens? The sh you know, only, f only firms of type K are affected. They get a technology boost, their productivity goes up, their output goes up by the same proportion, and nothing happens to anybody else. So final output goes up by, you know, some fraction. The fraction nu K is the cost share of firms of type K. What happens to prices? Well, remember the, f the, pr the price of the final good is normalized to one throughout. So if some prices fall, other prices have to rise. Well, the price of good K has, the, the K goods have to have a price decrease. There's more of that stuff around. The only way to sell it is by cutting the price. And so all other firms enjoy a price increase. Um, so that's it. Now, it's a, little, it's a little tricky to ask what happens to wages at this point. Um, I guess, you know, one, one, one story you could tell is, say, wh labor is mobile within firms of the same type. So all the labor that was working for type, you know, J firms can shop around at different type J firms. And in that case, you know, the labor market would still be competitive, and the wage change for... Um, for these workers, would be positive. Their, out, their productivity hasn't changed. The price of their output's gone up, so they get a boost. And for these guys, there are two effects. They're, they're pr the price of their output's gone down, but their productivity's gone up. So there's a horse race. Um, I guess I, I should just say, since I haven't put it on a slide, um, the, 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 the the productivity effect wins. The price doesn't go down enough to, to completely negate that. Okay, what happens in the long run? Well, the first thing you find is that in the long run, if you think about final output, you know, there's, there's no extra boost from reallocating workers. And this is really just, it's like a, the proof rests on the envelope theorem. So, you know, initially labor was efficiently allocated, so it was maximizing final output. If you do a small, you know, if you have a small perturbation to one in technology, to a first order approximation, reallocating labor doesn't have any effect. So you get a boost from the pr productivity increase, but you don't get any additional boost to a first order by reallocating labor. Okay, so there's no additional effect on final output. Um, but it does affect, you know, the prices and quantities for individual goods and, it, um, and you know, the allocation of labor. Okay, so if we want to look at uh, what happens to the labor allocation, you know, it, you know, if you go back to those competitive equilibrium conditions, it's like, you know, J minus one equations in the same number of unknowns. Just, you know, differentiate and you get a system of equations. And what you find is that the, the, the signs, you know, the, the, the pattern of adjustments depends on the signs of these two expressions here. And if you, uh, to think about the, the logic here, 
um, it's enough to think about a special case with just two technologies and one or the other is improved. Okay, and notice that uh, the size of the price decline for the product that has the improved technology is related to this uh, you know, productivity factor divided by rho. And rho, you know, think you know, five or six or seven for rho. So that gets downweighted. Okay, now to think about what's going to happen to this boundary, this threshold between the type one and type two, we have to remember that initially both firms are just indifferent about, uh, they're both willing to hire this worker with human capital B1. Okay, so if, uh, if the firm that gets the technology boost is the lower technology firm, um, okay, before this, this change, that firm was, you know, it was just, you know, ready. It, it could hire the firm with, the, the, the worker with human capital B1. That would, that would be okay. And now this guy has become, you know, more productive. And his productivity has really, it's gone up even more than everybody else in the firm. Because he's the best worker in that firm. So he's getting the biggest boost from this productivity shock. So now they're really, they really want to keep this guy. So, um, so that's what this, uh, this next line says. The average productivity boost in the firm is that capital Psi 1. This particular individual is getting the boost, uh, that term in the middle, phi sub x. And, uh, and the inequality runs that way because x1 is the best, er, b1 is the best guy in the firm. Okay, and then, you, and then in addition, you multiply by rho, so the inequality runs the right way. And this X1 firm certainly wants to expand uh, employment. Okay, so what does that do? All right, so initially the price of the, the you know, the, the type one firms had fallen. Now they're expanding employment. Their price is gonna fall even more sharply the price of the other good is going to rise even more sharply. So it kind of, it, it uh, reinforces the original pattern. Um, but all of, the, all of the workers get uh, a wage increase. These guys, it's just the fact that the price of their output went up. And uh, for these guys, the price has gone down, but it's more than offset. Remember, this thing is related to Psi 1, and it's downweighted by Rho. So, Everybody gets a boost, and these, for these guys, the, the size of the boost is uh, increasing in their human capital. Okay, so now I want to think about what happens if I give the technology boost to the X2 firm. So now this, this worker at the threshold, he's the lowest human capital type in the firm that's getting the technology change. So his personal productivity increase is less than the average across his coworkers. Okay, so this inequality runs the other way, but we still have this row greater than one. So if, that, if the gap between in there isn't too big, this inequality will still run you know, the same way it did before. And I guess here, you know, the, other, the other fact here is it depends on how, you know, how fine the grid is for these technologies. If the technologies, you know, if we distinguish between technologies on a pretty fine scale, then, you know, if we look within a technology type for a firm, they're just, they're hiring a rather, you know, narrow band of the workforce. So this, uh, the disparity in that, in the first line there is not much. In fact, you know, if you look at the model with a continuum of types on both sides, each, each X type has its unique uh, choice of H. And so, you know, the, the, this, this thing, there's just equality because all the workers are the same within a, within a firm type. Okay, so with that one, uh, one little proviso, it's uh, the same as before. And um, I've checked, you know, for J equal to three and five, and it, you know, it's, it's sort of messy to do the whole thing. But the logic seems to, I think the logic carries out. 
And uh, certainly, in all the cases that I've checked, wages rise for everybody. And I think this is the, the logic that Daron was talking about this morning, which is, you know, if you hit the type two, say type K firms with a technology boost, you increase their output. That increases output of the final good. That drives up demand for everybody else's goods. And that drives up their prices. And, and that, that's kind of the logic. OK, so let's see uh, just a little numerical example. So in this one, uh, this is the same example we had before. And I'm going to give a technology boost to the top 10% of firms. Um, the top 5% get a big boost. And then I, because this is a continuous example, to make the uh, differential equation work well, I want to smooth out that boost. So there's the technology boost. Um, a lot of firms get zero boost. The ones at the top get about 20%, and then it's smooth in between. Um, here I look at the change in employment. So these firms, the firms with no boost lose employment. The firms at the top surely gain. And in this, you know, uh, this middle group that's getting smaller technology increases, it depends on how big of an increase they're getting. And I guess the main thing I want to emphasize is that if we look at the wage changes, the, 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 the workers that are directly <laughs> affected get pretty big wage changes. But everybody gets something. Everybody's above zero. The ones at the bottom are modest, but you know, they're certainly not losing. OK, so the rising tide lifts all boats. Um, can we you know, reverse this? Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking, what would happen instead of altering the, the technology to X, if we change something about the distribution of human capital, so going from the other direction, suppose we like improved our worst performing schools and censored the bottom of the distribution or something. Mm -hmm. uh, something that affected the lower tail, right? Is that going to kind of have ripple effects on wages through the rest of the, of the distribution? Is it going to do similar things to technology, or is that going to look very different? I would think there's still going to be this element that it's going to raise productivity at some firms. That's going to increase final output. That's going to drive up demand for everybody else's products. So that element's still going to be there. That's a nice idea. I haven't thought about that experiment, but that would be my first impression. OK, so let's, uh, let's look at this. Let's look at a slightly different uh, version of this model. So I, to, to reverse this, I want to think about a model where the price effects are going to work a little differently. So I want to have a two-tier production. Um, at the, think of the top tier. Final output is now produced as, you know, it's with um, like industry aggregates as inputs. So here I'm thinking of, you know, think about two-digit SIC codes. So we have food, uh, clothing, shelter, different uh, that are the, uh, the top tier, those are combined in a, to produce final output. So maybe that could be Cobb Douglas. And then within each industry or sector, uh, differentiated goods are produced, used to produce the industry aggregate the same way they were before. And the key assumption is going to be that this, lower, this aggregator at the lower level has a higher elasticity of substitution. So, Different, you know, a sweater is a good substitute for a jacket, but clothes are not a good substitute for food. Okay, so let's for the here. Let's think about a Cobb Douglas at the top. Uh, it doesn't have to be Cobb Douglas. The only important thing is the the elasticity is lower than the other. Um, okay, and here are the demands for the sectoral intermediates. They look just like the the previous case. Here I put in some, uh, all right, here we have these weights, the theta weights. And we have the price of the sectoral intermediate and the price of the final good, remember, is always one. And the technologies for the sectoral intermediates are just what we had before. Now, but the thing I want to allow to vary across sector is the number of firms and the distribution of technologies. So some sectors could be higher tech. They put more weight on the high X's, and some could be low tech. They put more weight on the low X's. 
Okay, and rho has to be greater than sigma. Here I'm going to take sigma to be 1. Now the demand for differentiated inputs looks just the way it did before, except that now, all right, notice that the demand for the sectoral aggregate is there, ys, and also the price of the sectoral aggregate. But those two things are linked together through demand for final goods. So um, if you get rid of the P, capital PS, you put in that. Now this guy has a positive exponent, that has a negative exponent, and rho's greater than sigma, so the negative one gets more weight. So the fact is that increasing output of the sectoral aggregate, it has a bigger effect if, if you increase the production of that sectoral ag aggregate you know, someplace else, for this particular firm, it has a stronger effect through prices than the direct quantity effect. So that's the key thing that's different here. Okay, so now I want to just think about um, an example. So this is a kind of embarrassingly simple example. All right, so final output is Cobb-Douglas. There are two sectors with equal weight. And I want to think about three technology levels. So um, there's a mass of one of firms in each sector. Sector two is high tech. All of its firms have, there are three uh, skill levels, three technology levels, and they're going to, the skills and the technologies in this example are just going to match perfectly. So all the firms in, in the high tech sector, sector two, have the high at highest X and they hire the highest skill workers. Among firms in sector one, some have the medium level X and some have the low level. The medium X hire the medium workers and low X hire low workers. Every firm employs one, uh, one worker. So these are, also, these are firm outputs. And the sectoral level aggregates, you know, in, in sector two, it's just that the, the output of the typical firm. And in sector one, it's this, you know, uh, weighted average of the two. The prices are in sector two, it's just the uh, output of sector one divided by the output of sector two, but the output of sector two is that little yh. In sector one, it depends on whether we look at the, the low firm or the medium firm. So this is kind of the sectoral thing, and that's the uh, particular product component. Okay, and I guess, all right, so again, in this, in this setup, remember, wages are always proportional to, you know, price times productivity. So that's what we want to ask is for these uh, three types, what happens to prices and productivities? All right, so I, what I, the experiment I want to do is in the low tech, in the, in the low tech sector, I'm going to take those firms with uh, technology XM, and I'm just going to increase that value a little bit. So XM becomes XM plus epsilon, a little boost there. If it's a small boost, it's not going to cause any labor reallocation. So what's going to happen? If we look at the high tech, the firms in the high tech sector, their price goes up, nothing else happens. So their wages go up. If we look at the low technology firms in the low tech sector, what happens there? Well, their productivity didn't change, and the price of their good falls. Why is that? The only thing that happens is um, we have this y hat term, and since rho is, you know, if, uh, if rho is bigger than two, then this term is negative, and these guys get a wage cut. What about the firms that actually get the technology boost? Um, this is the one where certainly if rho's greater than two, they get an increase. Um, if rho's between one and two, it depends a little bit on this uh, cost share thing. Okay, so that's, 
So the idea here is that the technology boost for these uh, middle firms, it causes a wage cut for the guys at the low firm. And you know, what's the intuition? It's just that those, those, those other firms in the same sector that are getting the technology boost, they're producing a close substitute. So now the price falls for these guys, and you know, that's it. They lose. So that's, you know, that I would say that's, you know, a place to look for if you, you know, you see one reason why you could see declining wages for some workers in some sectors. It's not, it's just the price of their good fell. Why? Because somebody else is producing a good substitute more, uh, more effectively. I don't know if there's really any, any more to say here. So here's, um, here's an example. It's like related to the first one. But I've put uh, sector two has a high, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, firms with this here X is continuous again. The high tech sector, the red sector has lots of firms with high H. The low tech sector has lots of firms with, with low X, excuse me, with X. Um, Uh, the distribution of workers across sectors, uh, the, most of the low skill workers are in the low tech sector and uh, all of the highest skill workers are in the high tech sector. And now you could think about here just giving, you know, this technology change, think about a change that kind of, uh, this is the original, d you know, density for uh, X types. You just take something out of the middle here and add it up at the top. So give shift this distribution. And what happens? Well, every worker now is working with a better technology. You get, you know, this just kind of pushes all the way down the scale. So everybody's working with a better technology. Nevertheless, these guys at the bottom, their price has fallen enough so that they, they take a wage loss. Okay, so uh, I see I'm one minute, two minutes ahead. Okay, so the conclusion is just, I think we need better, to understand these changes in wage, uh, wages, long run changes in wages, you have to think more about how skill interacts with technology. And I said I talked for one minute about growth, so the, 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 the problem, is, you know, if you have the, a distribution of firm types and worker types, constructing a balanced growth path is hard. You have to keep them just kind of lined up. And to make it balanced, you have to have the incentives to invest, you know, just so to keep them, you know, not only are they lined up at date zero, but they stay lined up. And that's really the hard part, is thinking about a way to, uh, you know, kind of, so, you know, kind of cook the incentives to invest on both sides so that they're both, you know, in equilibrium investing at a rate that keeps the distributions lined up. Um, that's what's hard about it. Um, I can do it by just, you know, cooking two distributions that are basically the same as each other and then the incentives to invest are the same as each other. And you get a, you get a balanced growth out path out of that but it's very knife edge. So if you try and do any comparative static, the model uh, just kind of falls apart. So that's what I'm working on next. Okay. Thank you.